On the 30th of August, 1939, the Panzers swept into Poland, and Britain and France honored their pledges by declaring war on Germany. The Second World War had begun. Within hours, the air raid sirens wailed over London, and people ran for the shelters. Less than two weeks later, another sound was heard on Britain's radios, which was to become almost as familiar to her people. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. Here are the Reichs and the Hamburg Station Bremen and Station DXB on the 31 meter band. The speaker soon received the derisive nickname Lord Hawhaw. Although the news he read was often, at least in the early days, full of Allied defeats, few people in Britain ever took him seriously. Most felt that one day the traitor responsible would get his just deserts. More than five years later, at Bow Street Magistrates Court on the 18th of June, 1945, a small, undistinguished man was charged under a law which was almost 600 years old. William Joyce was to go on trial for his life, for aiding the king's enemies in time of war. For more than five years, he had been Hitler's spokesman to Britain, the reviled and ridiculed Lord Hawhaw, and he was about to pay for it. Yet there was real doubt whether the British state had any right to judge William Joyce, for Lord Hawhaw was born an American and had become a German citizen. Joyce's father, Michael, had emigrated to the United States from County Mayo in Ireland. He was naturalized in 1894. William Joyce was born on the 24th of April, 1906, at 1377 Herkimer Street in Brooklyn, New York. When he was three, his family returned to Ireland. But there is no evidence of any of them ever applying for naturalization as British citizens. In 1921, the family moved to London. After school, Joyce took a history and English course at the University of London. He also applied to join the officer training corps. In his application, Joyce took pains to emphasize that he was in no way connected with the United States. He referred to himself as a young man of purely British descent and was supported by a statement from his father that we are all British and not American citizens. Joyce also referred to helping British forces in Ireland during the Troubles, which led to the founding of the Irish Free State. There seems little doubt that the young Joyce had run messages or undertaken other jobs for the notorious Black and Tans, the ex-army force which brutally helped the regular police and army units against Irish nationalists. While at the university, Joyce joined the British Young Fascists. These admirers of Mussolini, who had just seized power in Italy following his march on Rome, were violently anti-communist. In the course of one street battle, Joyce was injured by a razor slash. This left him permanently scarred on the right side of his face from ear to mouth. But this incident did not stop Joyce from getting a first-class degree in 1927. He went to work for the Conservative Party and took a postgraduate degree in psychology. On the 4th of July, 1933, Joyce applied for a British passport. In his application, he claimed to be a British citizen by birth, having been born in Galway. was a claim that he was to repeat when the passport was renewed. In that same year, Hitler's Nazi government came to power in Germany. For many extreme right-wingers, this was now the model to be admired and imitated.
Joyce joined the British Union of Fascists. He was appointed director of propaganda and deputy leader of a movement which openly imitated Hitler's methods. The Black Shirt's founder, Sir Oswald Mosley, had been born into an old Tory family. Starting as a Conservative Member of Parliament, he had moved to the Labour Party in 1924 and served as a minister in the first Labour government from 1929 to 30. He then quit Labour and founded his own party, dedicated to establishing an authoritarian fascist regime. Joyce was soon in the thick of the fighting which always seemed to surround the British blackshirts. In October 1934, he and Sir Oswald were charged with riotous assembly. They were acquitted. Although most Britons regarded the British Union of Fascists as buffoons, they had some high-placed supporters. For there were many upper-class Britons who admired Germany's new Führer and felt their own country could do with a bit less democracy. They saw Hitler's actions as an understandable attempt to right the injustices of the Versailles Treaty. So, as Hitler reoccupied the Saarland in 1935 and the Rhineland in 1936, these appeasers worked to encourage the British government to ally itself with Germany. Hitler's British sympathizers were heartened by the actions of their former king, Edward VIII. After his abdication, as Duke of Windsor, he visited Germany and was open in his admiration of the Nazi regime. But the violence of the black shirts brought widespread condemnation and revulsion. Membership plunged, and at the beginning of 1937, Joyce left the party. He implied by his own choice, but Sir Oswald saw things differently. We had a great financial crisis, which parties have, or other parties have them too. And I had in, in one afternoon to tell 101 members of our staff out of 140 that they were redundant. They had to go, a terrible undertaking. And I chose to keep the organizers and to dispense with the propagandist, he being a propagandist. Being a very vain little man, he's one of those tiny little men who are often very vain, uh, he was stricken to the heart by this, thought that above all I should have kept him. I never had the slightest trouble with him before. He's an ultra-disciplined man. He went out of the office blazing with fury and denouncing everybody, myself included, so I promptly expelled him. Despite this setback, Joyce had the consolation of marrying Margaret Cairns White at Kensington Registry Office in February 1937. He also founded his own party, the National Socialist League, a month later, and wrote a book on its philosophy. He devoted himself to this over the next two years, tirelessly calling for an anti-communist alliance between Britain, Germany and Italy. Joyce was twice charged with public order offences. His new party attracted few recruits, and it seems likely that at least some of the money for its organisation was coming from Nazi Germany. By summer 1939, Europe was poised on the brink of war. It had been narrowly avoided the year before, when Britain and France had allowed Hitler to dismember Czechoslovakia. Now, Nazi Germany had signed a pact with the Soviet Union. Secure from the threat of a Soviet attack, Hitler's armies now threatened Poland, which Britain and France were pledged to defend. On the 24th of August, 1939, Joyce applied for a renewal of his passport. Again, he insisted that he was British by birth. Three days later, he dissolved the National Socialist League, and then he and his wife disappeared, until... Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. Here are the Reichs and the Ambush. Joyce made his first broadcast to Britain on the 18th of September, and he soon became the main voice of the German propaganda campaign against the British Empire. He and Margaret had reached Berlin, their spiritual home, at the beginning of the month, and he soon found a job helping the regime he adored. 
for it was now a regime at war. Nazi Germany had attacked Poland on the 1st of September, and Britain and France had honored their pledge to come to the help of the Poles. Propaganda minister Josef Goebbels was confident that his new recruit would soon find ways of appealing to his audience. But Joyce's early broadcasts in September and October 1939 did little to establish the accuracy of his information. For he announced the destruction of several British cities months before any German bombs had fallen on the country. And some of his stories were laughable. The British Ministry of Misinformation has been conducting a systematic campaign of frightening British women and girls about the danger of being injured by splinters from German bombs. The women have reacted to these suggestions and alarms by requesting their milliners to shape the spring and summer hats out of very thin tin plate. Such reports made Lord Haw Haw a figure of fun and ridicule during the early months of the war. But suddenly he came to seem more sinister. For in May 1940, German forces launched a blitzkrieg on their enemies in the West. Within six weeks, the panzers had shattered their opponents, bringing about the surrender of France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. As Britain's expeditionary force fell back to Dunkirk and was rescued from the beaches, Lord Haw Haw exulted. There are in England today men who have been through a worse hell than they had ever conceived to be possible. It is for them to speak and tell the people what they know. They bring with them not only blood, mud, dust and shattered nerves. They bring with them also facts which the people of England have a right to know. Thanks, which it is their bounden duty to impart. As the British people prepared for what seemed like an inevitable German invasion, the nasal voice of the man they had derided did achieve some isolated successes in affecting morale and spreading spy scares. He heaped scorn particularly on their new leader. Indeed, Mr. Churchill, with quite unusual frankness, admitted that the military results of the Belgian capitulation would be very grave. When this spiteful old creature, blind with prejudice and playing the almighty dictator, has to use such language, the end cannot be far distant. But somehow, the British did not seem to realize this. In the skies over southern England, the Royal Air Force fought the Luftwaffe to a standstill and forced Hitler to cancel the proposed invasion. Instead, bombing raids against British cities, at first by day and then at night, would force the British population to understand the mistake they were making. As Britain's cities burned, Lord Haw Haw exulted in these demonstrations of German power, which must end in certain victory. The much derided Blitzkrieg, which term incidentally was invented by yourselves, has become a grim reality. The lightning has struck, and in striking, it has shattered the very foundation of the once mighty British Empire. But still, the British failed to realize what they must do. They continued to be deluded by Winston Churchill. His criminal sense of irresponsibility has brought the English people and the British Empire 
the edge of the precipice. One day he will have to answer to the British people and the world for his deeds. And that day is separated from the pre-war days of 1939 by a long trail of misery and blood. In September 1940, Joyce had become a citizen of the apparently triumphant German Reich. In April 1941, he was given a German military passport. But then, early on the 22nd of June 1941, Dr. Goebbels himself strode into the broadcasting studios with an announcement which made the world hold its breath. He revealed that at dawn, German troops had crossed the frontier into Soviet Russia. Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's gamble to destroy his greatest enemy, had begun. At first, as German troops thrust towards the gates of Moscow, all seemed to go well. Joyce continued to boast of the successes of his chosen Reich. But three years later, in September 1944, the situation had changed radically. The Western Allies had landed in Normandy and were poised to break out of their beachhead while the Russians were pressing in from the east. In his broadcasts, Joyce continued to maintain that all was still going well for the Reich. His faith was rewarded on the 1st of September when he received the Kriegsverdienstkreuz, a German civilian decoration for outstanding war service signed personally by Adolf Hitler. But every night, Joyce's optimistic words were being contradicted by the Allied bombers, which were pounding Germany's cities into ruins. For all but the most dedicated Nazis, the evidence of inevitable defeat lay all around. And even the most dedicated were not above taking precautions. On the 3rd of November, 1944, William Joyce acquired a new passport in the name of Wilhelm Hansen, born on the 11th of March, 1906, in Galway. By the 25th of April, 1945, Russian troops had surrounded Berlin and were fighting in the suburbs. Five days later, William Joyce made his last broadcast. Now, in this, the most serious time of our modern age, I beg you to realize that the fight is on. You have heard something about the Battle of Berlin. You know that there, a tremendous, world-shattering conflict is being waged. Good. I would only say that the men who have died in the Battle of Berlin have given their lives to show that whatever else happens, Germany will live because the people of Germany have in them the secret of life, endurance, will, and purpose. And therefore I say to you, in these last words, you may not hear from me again for a few months, I say, Es lebe Deutschland. Heil Hitler and farewell. That same day, Adolf Hitler killed himself, and Joyce and his wife disappeared into the chaos of the last days of the Reich.
A month later, on the 28th of May, two British officers, Captain Licorice and Lieutenant Perry, were collecting logs in a wood near Flensburg on the Danish border. Perry later described what happened. We took a, a 1500 wave truck, drove into this forest here, and as we got deeper and deeper into it, we suddenly saw a very odd tramp-like figure appear on our left. When he saw what we were doing, he pointed with his walking stick to some logs and spoke to us in French. And then, in English, he said, oh, there are three or four more here. And when I turned to Licorice, he said to me, you know, that sounded terribly like William Joyce. I engaged him in conversation, and he told me all about coniferous trees and deciduous trees. And by that time, I was quite certain that it was William Joyce. But the problem was that left hand in his pocket, and I was certain he was carrying a gun. And then he picked up a log with both hands, put it into the truck, and before he had an opportunity to put his hand back in his pocket, I challenged him and said, you wouldn't be William Joyce by any chance, would you? And his hand dropped back to his pocket, I thought he was going for his gun. I drew my own pistol, aimed low, and fired. When the officers searched the wounded man, a passport revealed that he was indeed William Joyce. Under close guard, Joyce was taken back to England. His trial for treason began at the Old Bailey on the 17th of September, 1945. Mr. Justice Tucker presided, and the prosecution was led by the Attorney General of the new Labour government, Sir Hartley Shawcross. Joyce's defence was led by G.O. Slade, K.C., who made no attempt to deny that his client had indeed broadcast propaganda for Germany. But he argued there was no case to answer, since Joyce had never been a British citizen. As an American, and then German subject, he owed no allegiance to the British crown. The case came to hinge on Joyce's passport application, which showed that he had chosen to regard himself as a British citizen, and on the question of whether a person could still owe allegiance to a country of which he was not officially a citizen, as Sir Hartley Shawcross later explained. Of course, the law about treason is that it is an offence which can be committed not only by British subjects, but also by foreigners who are under a duty of allegiance, albeit of a temporary kind, to the Crown. The position of Joyce was that he had obtained a British passport, representing himself to be a British subject, and when in Germany, he was entitled to the protection of the British Crown. Consequently, he owed a reciprocal duty of allegiance to the Crown. Once Mr. Justice Tucker had agreed with this interpretation, the jury had no choice but to find Joyce guilty. On the 19th of September, he was convicted and condemned to death. Joyce appealed, but both this and a further appeal to the House of Lords were rejected. Joyce was hanged at Wandsworth Prison on the 3rd of January, 1946, after a final appeal for mercy had been rejected by the Home Secretary. It was widely felt that Lord Haw Haw may have been foolish and misguided and should have been punished. But the British government should not have hung a man who had never been one of its country's citizens. <laughs>